Despite the popular perception, the Romans were actually quite tolerant of diverse religious beliefs. When the Roman legions conquered an area, they granted the indigenous population Roman citizenship and allowed them to continue practicing their own religious traditions without interference. An exception was made, however, when Julius Caesar conquered the Britons. The ancient Britons had a nasty habit of practicing human sacrifice by burning their victims alive in wicker cages. The Romans, who engaged in some pretty unpleasant violations of human rights themselves, were so appalled by the cruelty of the Britons that they outlawed their religion then and there. Other than that, religious tolerance or intolerance was pretty much left up to the personal and political beliefs of the emperor. Over the thousand-year history of the Roman Empire, some religious groups did suffer terrible persecution from time to time. Among these groups were the Jews, whose temple in Jerusalem was sacked and burned by the emperor Titus in 81 AD, and the Christians. Believing that Christians represented a danger to the state because they refused to burn incense to the image of the emperor, various emperors, as the verses Nero or Marcus Aurelius, ordered the religion stamped out. Sporadic persecutions of Christians continued over the years. Other emperors left the Christians alone although they did not sanction their religious practices. Then, what has been called a miracle happened. Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, became a Christian. In good motherly fashion, she set out to convert her son, who was not at all interested. He was, however, interested in retaining his power. At the time of Constantine, Rome was no longer ruled by a single emperor, but by a tetrarchy, a government of four rulers. After a six-year struggle with the other men in his tetrarchy, Constantine seized sole power by defeating his last rival, Maxentius, at the Battle of Mulvane Bridge. According to the story, the night before the battle, an angel carrying the cross appeared in Constantine's tent and said, In this sign thou shalt conquer. Constantine swore that if he defeated Maxentius in the battle the next day, he would become a Christian. The rest is history. Around the year 300 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine made a fateful decision. He moved the capital of the Roman Empire to the city of Byzantium in the east and renamed the city Constantinople. It's called Istanbul, Turkey today. This move symbolized a new Christian basis for the Roman state. But this move split the Roman Empire into two parts, with two emperors, one ruled Constantinople in the east, and the other ruled the Western Empire in Italy. When the central authority moved from Italy, Rome was left without a strong military presence. Tribes from the north began to swoop down onto the city. The western provinces soon fell prey to these barbarians, Visigoths, Ostagoths, and the Vandals, the name still in our language to describe a person who wantonly destroys property. Much of Rome was destroyed by the Goths. The followers of traditional Roman religion believed this new Christian religion brought about these troubles, that the city of Rome was being paid back for turning against the ancient gods. Although these were dark times, there were many bright spots in art and architecture. Three major shifts occurred that had far-reaching effects on the Western civilization. First, the cultural leadership moved north from the Mediterranean to France, Germany, and the British Isles. Second, Christianity triumphed over paganism and barbarianism. Third, emphasis shifted from the here and now to the hereafter, and with it, from the body as a beautiful object to the body as corrupt. Since the Christian focus was on salvation for a glorious afterlife, interest in realistically representing objects of the world disappeared. Nudes were forbidden, and even images of clothed bodies showed ignorance of anatomy. The Greco-Roman ideals of harmonious proportion and balance between the body and mind ceased to exist. Instead, medieval artisans were interested exclusively in the soul, 
especially in instructing new believers in church ideas. Art became the servant of the church. Theologians believed church members would come to appreciate divine beauty through material beauty, and lavish mosaics, paintings, and sculpture were the result. In architecture, this orientation towards the spiritual took the form of lighter, more airy buildings. The mass and bulk of Roman architecture gave way to buildings reflecting the ideal Christian, plain on the outside but glowing with spirituality, symbolic mosaics, frescoes, or stained glass inside. Medieval art was composed of three different styles. The Byzantine, Romanesque, and Gothic. When the Emperor Justinian decided to build a church in Constantinople, the greatest city in the world for 400 years, he wanted to make it as grand as his empire. He assigned the task to two mathematicians. They obliged his ambition with a completely innovative structure recognized as the climax in Byzantine architectural style. The Hagia Sophia, the name means holy wisdom, merged the vast scale of Roman buildings with an Eastern mystical atmosphere. Nearly three football fields long, it combined the Roman rectangular basilica layout with a huge central dome. For the first time in history, four arches forming a square, as opposed to round weight-bearing walls as in the Pantheon, supported the dome. This structural revolution accounted for the lofty, unobstructed interior with its soaring dome. Forty arched windows encircled the base of the dome, creating the illusion that it rests on a halo of light. This overhead radiance seems to dissolve the walls in divine light transforming the material into an otherworldly vision. Even today, its sheer size is astounding. Not made of steel, but of earlier building materials, iron, brick, and stone. The dome has a diameter of 108 feet and rises 180 feet off the floor. The towers on the outside, or minarets, were added later when the church became a mosque. Romanesque. With the Roman Catholic faith firmly established, a wave of church construction throughout Europe occurred. Builders borrowed elements from Roman architecture, such as a rounded arch and columns, giving rise to the term Romanesque for the art and architecture of the period. Yet because Roman buildings were timber-roofed and prone to fires, medieval artisans began to roof churches with stone vaulting, in this system, barrel or groin vaults resting on piers could span large openings with few internal supports or obstructions. Pilgrimages were in vogue at the time, and church architecture took into account the hordes of tourists visiting shrines of sacred bones, garments, and splinters from the true cross brought back by the crusaders. This layout was called cruciform, symbolizing the body of Christ on the cross. Arcades allowed pilgrims to walk around peripheral aisles without disrupting ceremonies for local worshippers in the central nave. At the center, a chevet, or pillow in French, called such because it was conceived as the resting place for Christ's head on the cross. Behind the altar were semicircular chapels with saints' relics. The exterior of Romanesque churches were rather plain, except for sculptural relief around the main portal. Since most churchgoers were illiterate, sculptures taught religious doctrine by telling stories in stone. Sculpture was concentrated in the tympanium, the semicircular space behind the arch above the lintel of the central door. Scenes of Christ's ascension to the heavenly throne were popular, as well as grisly Last Judgment dioramas where demons gobbled hapless souls while devils strangled or spitted naked bodies of the damned. The pinnacle of Middle Ages artistic achievement, rivaling the wonders of ancient Greece and Rome, was the Gothic Cathedral. 
In fact, these stone Bibles even surpass classical architecture in terms of technological daring. From the year 1200 to 1500, medieval builders erected these intricate structures with soaring interiors unprecedented in world architecture. What made the Gothic cathedral possible was two engineering breakthroughs, rib vaulting and exterior supports called flying buttresses. Applying such point supports where necessary allowed builders to forgo solid walls pierced by narrow windows for skeletal walls with huge stained glass windows flooding the interior with light. Gothic cathedrals acknowledge no dark ages. Their evolution was a continuous expansion of light until finally walls were so perforated as to be almost mullions framing immense fields of colored storytelling glass. In addition to the lattice-like quality of Gothic cathedral walls, verticality characterized Gothic architecture. Builders used the pointed arch, which increased both the reality and illusion of greater height. Architects vied for the highest naves. At Amiens, the nave reached an extreme height of 144 feet. When, as often happened, ambition outstripped technical skill and the naves collapsed, church members tirelessly rebuilt them. Gothic cathedrals were such a symbol of civic pride that an invader's worst insult was to pull down the tower of a conquered town's cathedral. Communal devotion to the buildings were so intense that all segments of the population participated in its construction. Lords and ladies, in worshipful silence, worked alongside butchers and masons, dragging carts loaded with stone from quarries. Buildings were so elaborate that construction literally took ages, six centuries for Cologne Cathedral, which explains why some seem a hodgepodge of successive styles. Chartres Cathedral was the visible soul of the Middle Ages. Built to house the Vale of the Virgin, given to the city by Charlemagne's grandson in 876, is a multimedia masterpiece. Its stained glass windows, the most intact collection of medieval glass in the world, measures 26,900 feet in total area. Illustrating the Bible, the lives of the saints, even traditional crafts in France, the windows are like a gigantic, glowing, illuminated manuscript. Some of the world's greatest art, in the form of mosaics, was created during the 5th and 6th centuries in Turkish Byzantium and its Italian capital, Ravenna. Mosaics were intended to publicize the now official Christian creed, so their subject was generally religion, with Christ shown as teacher and all-powerful ruler. Sumptuous grandeur with halos spotlighting sacred figures and shimmering gold backgrounds characterized these works. Human figures were flat, stiff, and symmetrically placed, seeming to float as if hung by pegs. Artists had no interest in suggesting perspective or volume. Tall, slim human figures with almond-shaped faces, huge eyes, and solemn expressions gazed straight ahead without the least hint of movement. Icons. As gloomy as these images of tortured martyrs were, no discussion of Byzantine art is complete without a look at icons. Icons were small, wood-paneled paintings believed to possess supernatural powers. The images of saints or holy persons were typically rigid frontal poses, often with halos and staring wide eyes. Icons supposedly had magical properties. According to legend, one wept, another emitted the odor of incense. Ardent believers carried them into battle or wore away their faces by kissing them. So powerful did the cult of the icons become that they were banned from 726 to 843 as a violation of the commandment against idolatry. Tapestries. Weavers in the Middle Ages created highly refined tapestries, minutely detailed with scenes of contemporary life. Large wool and silk hangings used to cut drafts decorated stone walls in chateaus and churches. A series of seven tapestries represented the unicorn legend. According to popular belief, the only way to catch this mystical beast was to use a virgin sitting in the forest for bait. The trusting unicorn would go to sleep with his head in her lap and awaken caged. The captured unicorn is chained to a pomegranate tree, 
a symbol of both fertility and because it contains so many seeds within one fruit, the church itself. During the Renaissance, the unicorn was linked to courtly love, but in the tapestry's ambiguous depiction, both lying down and rearing up, he symbolizes the resurrected Christ. Illuminated Manuscripts With hordes of pillagers looting and razzing cities of the former Roman Empire, monasteries were all that stood between Western Europe and total chaos. Here, monks and nuns copied manuscripts, keeping alive both the art of illustration in particular and Western civilization in general. By this time, the papyrus scroll used from Egypt to Rome was replaced by the vellum or calfskin or parchment made of lambskin bound at one side. Manuscripts were considered sacred objects containing the Word of God. They were decorated lavishly, so their outward beauty would reflect their sublime contents. Covers were made of gold, studded with precious and semi-precious gems. Until printing was developed in the 15th century, these manuscripts were the only form of books in existence, preserving not only religious teaching, but also classical literature. Some of the richest, purely ornamental drawings ever produced are contained in the illuminated gospel called the Book of Kells. The text was highly embellished with colorful abstract patterns, enormous letters, interlacing whorls, and fantastic animal imagery covered the entire pages. Because Italy maintained contact with Byzantine civilization, the art of painting was never abandoned. But at the end of the 13th century, a flowering of technically skilled painting occurred, with masters like Duccio, Cimabue, and Giotto of Florence breaking with the frozen Byzantine style for softer, more lifelike forms. Cimabue was one of the first Italian masters to paint in the Greek manner. Cimabue's altarpieces looked like Byzantine mosaics with gold backgrounds. But we see Cimabue more as a great teacher to two other artists who made some giant leaps in realistic painting. The first is Duccio. Duccio was a student of Cimabue. He mastered the ability to create space and depth by the placement of various objects which leads the eye from the foreground to the background. In this painting, Christ Calling Peter and Andrew, which was painted on a wooden panel, Duccio shows depth by showing fish in the net. The net overlaps the fishing boat, and the apostles Peter and Andrew are placed inside the boat. Christ is standing on the shore in front of the tall peak. Duccio pioneered the element of soft modeling of human forms and the unmistakable desire on the part of the artist to give his scene a lively, even contemporary touches in order to make us feel as if we were there. Giotto A popular legend tells us that Giotto was a poor shepherd who learned to draw on the flat stones in the field. One day the famous artist Cimabue came across Giotto at work on one of his drawings. He was so amazed at the boy's skill that he took him into his studio as his pupil. It was said that while he was studying with Cimabue, he painted a fly on the nose of one of his master's figures. The fly was so realistic that when Cimabue returned to work on the picture, he tried several times to brush it off before discovering that it was painted by his mischievous student. One of his frescoes, and a fresco, remember, is a painting in wet plaster, testifies to his monumental talent. It is entitled Lamentation and shows a group of mourners around the body of Christ following the crucifixion. The figures are modeled in light and dark so that they look as solid and as round as sculptures. There is a feel that real bodies exist beneath those robes. The picture is made to look more real by the addition of a natural background of blue sky, rocky ledges, and a dead tree. This may be the earliest example of a true blue sky and other parts of nature like a tree. Gone is the flat gold background that was the standard feature of earlier works. The purely spiritual does not interest Giotto. He vigorously pursues a more realistic course. Another great advancement developed by Giotto was his ability to show real emotions on the faces of his subjects. The grief-stricken Mary is holding Jesus, while the woman on the left has her arms raised in shock, and the woman to her right has her hands clasped by her face showing real sadness. Even the angels that fly overhead are in mourning. <laughs> 